Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay. In just a few seconds, I'll be joined by Alexander Buzgalin to talk about the significance of the life of Mikhail Gorbachev. Please don't forget there's a donate button uh, at, on the website if you support what we do. Uh, please go and click if you already have. Thank you. Uh, if you haven't subscribed on YouTube, please do, or on one of the various podcast platforms. And most importantly, uh, sign up for the email list. Be back in just a few seconds. On December 25th, 1991, Mikhail Gorbachev resigned as the leader of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and dissolved the Soviet Union itself. With his death on August 30th, Gorbachev has been mostly praised in the Western press for his vision of a social democratic Soviet Union within Europe, much like a Sweden or a Finland. Of course, that's not what happened. What actually followed was a period of rapacious capitalism, where public assets were looted by former leaders of the party and the bureaucracy. Alexander Busgallen was a member of the Central Committee of the CPSU in its last year and fought for quite a different vision of a reformed Soviet Union. Buzgalin is currently a professor and director of the Center of Modern Marxist Studies at Moscow State University, and he joins us now from Moscow. Thanks for, thanks for joining us again, Alexander. Uh, I'm very glad to be with you and to discuss very important questions as usual. So uh, the death of Gorbachev uh, is in some ways more about the end of the Soviet Union than it is about the figure of Gorbachev. Um, and, and so I know you had a very direct experience in the days or months before the end of the Soviet Union. You, you, you once told me the story about this, and maybe we, you could start there, and then we can get into the bigger question. You went to, you were not in the party, am I correct? But you went to a party congress, and you were part of a reform group that proposed certain reforms. But Gorbachev didn't agree with your reforms. Um, so what what was that about? Uh, it's uh, not exactly <laughs> the model of my life. So the logic was following. Uh, from 1985, in Soviet Union started some reforms. Uh, firstly, very mild, then more and more deep. And in uh, 1989, it became a real opportunity to be in a position officially without... By reforms, you mean more uh, openness in terms of how you could speak? Different, uh, different reforms, by the way. I want to tell about this a little later, that Gorbachev is not only glasnost and the freedom of speech and political uh, pluralism, it's much more complex uh, problem in economy and ideology and so on, so, but later. So okay. uh, in 1988, I think, I became a member of Communist Party of Soviet Union because it was possible to be in a position inside Communist Party. And in 1989, even winter 1989-1990, we created so-called Marxist platform. It was democratic, socialist, I can say even communist opposition to both uh, Stalinism and bourgeois reforms. Gorbachev in that period uh, was leader of uh, social democratic reforms, but in very pro-Western style. So it was more Western social democracy than, let's say, social democracy of uh, Plekhanov or even Kautsky. Very pro-Western model uh, of social democracy, center or right-wing model of social democracy, first. And second, he was in any case leader of huge bureaucratic machine. And he did not want to reform this bureaucratic machine. Communist Party and Central Committee was organized inside very bureaucratically. And uh, they cannot, uh, could not uh, react on very deep contradictions in the country. That's why we established this Marxist platform. For people who don't know too much about the period, what do you mean when you say organized very bureaucratically? Like, what's some examples? Well, first of all, it was the same huge apparatus of the Central Committee. If you wanted to make any changes, it was necessary to go through different departments, sub-departments, and so on. Uh, in regions, uh, party uh, leaders could not make anything without permission of the center, and they did not have initiative. Uh, they were part of machine, and they could not work without machine. They could not work without KGB. They could not work without uh, 
police uh, and it was very difficult to change this machine and we were talking about necessity to uh, radically reorganize uh, party state uh, in anti-bureaucratic basis and uh, the main question was also development of real not formal self-management in the enterprises real economic democracy real democracy grassroots democracy uh, gorbachev was playing with bourgeois forms of democracy it was possible to say blah 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 for uh, intelligence but it was no voice of ordinary people poor people who became people who became poor in soviet union in gorbachev period because of shortage of commodities so uh, and uh, many real forms of democracy were not developing grassroots democracy uh, and we were doing a lot in this sphere it's important by the way it was movement of um, self-management organs of uh, enterprises uh, big enterprises small enterprises in 1990 we had the uh, all union soviet union congress of the leaders of uh, self-management it was 1000 people from all the country it was intelligent very democratic people who wanted to have democratic socialism but they didn't have power and real democratization in economy was not uh, power of workers or engineers it was more power of directors who started uh, underground privatization even in soviet period and workers and engineers were fighting against this and they did not have support of communist party and they didn't have support of gorbachev by the way let me just highlight this you said the privatization began underground even during the days of the Soviet Union and and so and this is from uh, higher level party bureaucrats am I correct that they were already trying to develop a, a private ownership amongst that class uh, they were not against I can say uh, if we are talking about party bureaucrats and uh, as if okay it's necessary to explain in Gorbachev period appeared two wings uh, of bureaucrats and Communist Party. One part, uh, old style uh, bureaucrats who had communist or better to say uh, socialist illusions, formal socialist ideology in their brains. But at the same time, they were very cynical. They were, let's say, corrupted, not because of bribes, but because they wanted to go anywhere to have money. And they were oriented on the transformation of their power to the property, to the capital, but not very radically. They were passive, not active, and so on. This old generation of Communist Party bureaucrats. And we had young generation, uh, mainly in Komsomol Youth Communist Organization, uh, also part of uh, directors, uh, leaders of uh, former state and uh, formerly state enterprises. Uh, but uh, because Gorbachev allowed so-called arenda, leasing, and the uh, directors took enterprises in leasing, it was a strange situation when an enterprise with uh, equipment for billion dollars uh, was in leasing of director who had, uh, I don't know, maybe a few thousand dollars. So it was very uh, unbeautiful story. I, I, I'm trying to find polite word for this. One, you don't need to be polite. And two, what is the term you're using? Leasing, uh, uh, rent. Oh, lease, leasing, leasing, leasing. Okay, sorry. okay. Oh, I'm sorry for my pronunciation. Pronunciation, yes. It's okay. Uh, leasing of enterprises. Uh, so, uh, also, it was uh, growth of separatism of uh, regional leaders, and it was not uh, liberation of people in uh, different regions of former Soviet Union in Ukraine, not in, in Ukraine, it was not very radical. In Baltic republics, uh, in Georgia, in some regions of uh, Caucasus, it was uh, more uh, attempts of bureaucrats, communist and not communist leaders uh, in this former Soviet, it was not former Soviet republics to take power. It was not liberation from the below. It was a struggle of bureaucrats for their power in uh, former so in Soviet republics, which became then independent states. So, and we were against this. We were for support uh, and uh, recreation, uh, rebirth, renaissance of Soviet Union as unity 
uh, on the basis of initiatives from below. We were supporters of real self-management of enterprises and regional self-management for grassroots democracy, not for bureaucratic games in multi-party system. And definitely against Stalinism and definitely against uh, bourgeois transformation. By bourgeois transformation, you mean the, the sort of Western capitalist model. In fact, what actually happened in the 90s. So it's another story also very important uh, to understand why people don't like Gorbachev now. Uh, finally, uh, it became terrible. I want to stress terrible catastrophe uh, in the economy, in uh, living standards, in uh, social life, in geopolitics, in ideology, in culture. Uh, early 90s, 1990s, uh, our country had decline of gross national product uh, nearly 50 percent, one half. It was decline of real incomes for poor population, one half. It was um, uh, enormous growth of social polarization during a few months, not even years. It was criminal atmosphere. Uh, Gorbachev period uh, was period of discreditation of police uh, in all spheres, militia, militia. Uh, of course, it was not, uh, I don't know, very democratic organization, but uh, without um, control, without militia, without uh, punishment of criminal elements, it's impossible to live in society, especially when, you know, uh, Primitive accumulation of capital lead to the enormous violence everywhere. If you remember primitive accumulation of capital in the United States, it was must jim jim all these Western movies about primitive accumulation of capital. Gun is the main, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, tool for accumulation of capital. And uh, Gorbachev is responsible for decline of. Uh, real power of police. I'm a very democratic person, but in some aspects it's necessary to have police against these uh, bandits, organized bandits, yes? And uh, so it was all negative things. When Gorbachev is deciding, preparing to step down to dissolve the Soviet Union, he must know there's going to be a free-for-all looting the publicly owned enterprises and wealth. He, he has to know that's what's next, what's coming. Uh, it's a story which is a miracle for me. Uh, I cannot explain his personal behavior. Uh, in mass, uh, in public opinion, in uh, modern Russia, and even from 1990s, uh, all these decades, uh, Gorbachev is, uh, in Russian we have uh, such word, Baba. A uh, woman who cannot make something herself, I'm sorry, it's not anti-feminist, it's, it's just Russian uh, um, content. Uh, so woman who is uh, under the uh, oppression of men, uh, who is not uh, decisive, who cannot make uh, real actions, uh, who cannot take responsibility, uh, and so on. So, and this is main uh, negative uh, feeling to Gorbachev. Uh, why I said I cannot understand. I, I don't think that he is Baba, but uh, what I think, uh, he started from very good slogan in 1985, when he became general secretary of communist party. He said, main factor of our rebirth of our new epoch is the social creativity of the masses. And he made quotation from Lenin. Uh, then he said, we must have acceleration of economy and we must use plan, strategic planning, um, socialist methods and some forms of democracy in order to uh, open energy of the people. It was not bad words at all. And some steps in this direction really appeared. And uh, until 1988, it was more democratization in the, enter, uh, in the sphere of enterprise management. It was more opportunities for um, self-organization of people in uh, regions, uh, creation of new forms of green movements and so on. So it was uh, some positive changes. But then step by step, he started moving in the direction of um, firstly, uh, Western style social democracy. Then uh, he's not supported, but he did not criticize. He did not attack uh, those who were e exactly for bourgeois restoration. 
And it was direct lie, but maybe not subjective lie of leaders like Yeltsin, like uh, Gavril Popov, leader of Moscow in 1990s, like Sobchak, leader of St. Petersburg in 1990s. All these uh, so-called leaders of perestroika of opposition, they were speaking in uh, late 80s about necessity to have Swedish model of socialism and even more socialism than in Sweden more socialism than in Finland. They never said about total privatization. They never said about primitive accumulation of capital. And I don't know, maybe they were really stupid or primitive not to understand what really will take place. But uh, for me, for my comrades, we were 30 years old, by the way, not very old <laughs> persons in that period. It was absolutely... Uh, we were absolutely sure that it will be not social democracy, it will be not Sweden, it will be a third world country with all criminal forms of capitalism in the periphery. But it was not uh, the case for Gorbachev, for Communist Party bureaucrats, for uh, opposition. That's why we created this Marxist platform with all this critique, with predictions. And uh, some of my three of us became members of Central Committee of Communist Party. It is the main organ, ruling organ. And uh, when it was plenum meeting of Central Committee, Central Committee was big, uh, nearly 300 people. It was one of the first meeting after 28th Congress, it was 1990. And they said, if we continue the same politics, Communist Party will collapse and Soviet Union will disappear. By the way, when it was the case in 1992, some old leaders of Communist Party said, Alexander, you are responsible for the destruction of the Soviet Union. You are responsible for the destruction of Communist Party. You said one year before that it will be destroyed and it was destroyed. <laughs> you are son of the bitch, Sasha. <laughs> so, but it was not clear for Gorbachev. It was not clear for Communist Party bureaucrats. And Really, I want to stress another aspect, if it's possible, to move from Gorbachev to real contradictions of the country. Well, before you do that, let me let me just explore this Gorbachev thing a little further. His vision, which is being so praised now in the Western media, that Russia, Soviet Union would become a social democracy, part of Europe, uh, and part of the West, essentially. Uh, it seems to me if Gorbachev really believed that, it's so naive and so delusional that, that Western capital would ever allow Russia to become that kind of player in Europe because, I mean, given everything the Soviet Union had in terms of size and resources and manpower, it wouldn't have been long in that situation where the Soviet Union would have been, you know, the equal to Germany, it would have been a powerful player in Europe. And I can't imagine the Germans and Americans ever allowing that. So I don't know if he was naive or he was not smart enough. I don't know him personally well. I, I saw him only in the Tribune of the Congress uh, and so on. Uh, we never met. I met some uh, leaders of uh, party, members of political bureau. It was uh, nearly little more than 10 persons. And some of them were not bad but and uh, not supporting Gorbachev. But with Gorbachev, I didn't meet myself uh, closely. After collapse of the Soviet Union, we met, but not in that period. Uh, I think that uh, he was not smart enough. He was not decisive enough. Uh, I cannot say naive. Naive is a word for... Uh, young girl, 16 years old uh, girl who dreams about romantic love, yes. Uh, but uh, he was not a young girl at all, and he was political leader. So uh, I don't know what kind of word I can use here. Uh, so, but it's not naive. It's uh, maybe blind, better to say. At some point before the coup, then there's a coup in what is it August of 1990 and then he comes back for a few months and then he steps down at some point is he more or less captured by the forces that are preparing for this big privatization and looting of the economy does he be in some ways does he wind up being their tool uh, it's complex question uh... I think Gorbachev was not uh, captain of the bold. 
uh, he was in the boat which was moving according to the stream. This boat didn't have a uh, rule, how to say, in the car when you move. Yeah, steer a steering wheel. Steering wheel, yes. And uh, this car didn't have uh, engine. It was like, a, I don't know, a piece of wood moving in the uh, river. And Gorbachev was not captain, really. Uh, that's why he's responsible for not being captain. Uh, is it clear? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah in the yeah, period yeah. of radical changes, when the streams are very different and the dominant stream is negative, uh, reactionary, the captain of the boat must be decisive, strong, and must create a team which will fight against these negative trends. And Gorbachev started, uh, he destroyed bureaucratic uh, system of management. It, it was necessary to transfer this bureaucratic system, but not to destroy completely the system of, of governing, not management, governing in the country. But uh, he really destroyed governing at all. Not change from of bureaucratic governing to democratic governing, but he destroyed governing. Not he personally, but he did not uh, support, uh, he did not fight against destruction. What I can say. Did the privatization, uh, the development of this class of oligarchs, does that begin while Gorbachev is still there or it all happens afterwards? Uh, it was underground genesis. You know, like, uh, uh, like uh, when a tree is growing, first the seed is in the uh, land. But seed is uh, growing, and then first small green elements appear. So here it was not a tree, it was something ugly and terrible. It was dragon growing <laughs> from the seeds. So, and seeds of dragon were developing in Gorbachev period. It was not a big, huge dragon uh, of oligarchs, but it was the beginning. Uh, because of the so-called freedom, uh, but it was really disorganization, not freedom. Because of the organization of governing, we had the enormous growth of uh, shadow business, criminal shadow business in late 80s. We had the underground privatization with leasing, leasing of enterprises by directors. Now, what does that mean? They're, 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 they're charging outside forces to come in and use the enterprise? What does it mean, leasing, renting? Director of the enterprise, manager of the enterprise, uh, received power to be uh, executive owner of the enterprise, to buy, to sell uh, production, uh, to reorganize production, to decrease production, to change production, and so on. So be they became quasi-owners, not formal owners, but real owners. And they made first accumulation of capital on this basis. Not all enterprises, but uh, many big enterprises and small enterprises in the country. And this was supposed to be done in the name of opposing bureaucracy. Yes, it was the growth of democracy, economic democracy, but it was not the growth of economic democracy, democracy power of people, democrats. But here it was power of directors instead of power of God's plan. Uh, I don't know what is worse. Well, maybe this starts to answer my next question because so after Gorbachev steps down and they start privatizing, supposedly these public, Assets are purchased, but where do these guys get the money to buy anything? They did not buy anything. They steal everything. And it's not a joke, unfortunately. Uh, huge enterprises like Ural Mars Zavod, uh, it's enterprise with 30, 20, 50,000 of workers. With machines, uh, the metal in this enterprise is just metal of machines costs, I don't know, billions of dollars. What enterprise, but simply to sell the metal, this all equipment, it will be billion of dollars. They bought this enterprise for 10, uh, 5 million dollars, which they accumulated during primitive, this criminal uh, shadow business uh, in Gorbachev period. And then they, it was game. Uh, it was uh, so-called auction. When you must pay very small money, you buy enterprise, and then you must pay back uh, uh, because you have enterprise and you will pay back from the selling of the production produced in this enterprise. 
I heard somebody told me that I think it's 1990 or 91. There's a loan from the IMF and it was supposed to go to the Russian government to help pay debt, but it was actually diverted into private hands and then used to buy public resources. Yes, it was uh, after destruction of Soviet Union after 1991. I'm sorry, 1991. Uh, also, Western money and big money, it was billions of dollars, so went to these uh, goals. It was a lot of uh, illegal privatization. Then it's also important. It was enormous inflation. In one year, prices grew up for 30 times, not 30 percent, 30 times. Every month it was growing your prices two, three, five times per month. So uh, enormous. And uh, in the beginning, it was the uh, official estimation of enterprise in the rubles. After uh, a few months, it was, uh, I don't know, 100 times less, 50 times less than it was in the beginning. So it was a lot of these speculations, which led to the privatization of enterprises by criminal uh, leaders, by uh, shadow economy leaders, by some uh, young Communist Party bureaucrats, young, decisive, strong, uh, aggressive, I can say even aggressive. And a few, let's say, talent entrepreneurs uh, came also to this game. I don't know, thousands of them were killed, but uh, one, two, three from them became big <laughs> businessmen. Were killed because they were fighting each other over the wealth? Yes, it was, yeah. Maybe not directly killed, but kidnapped, killed, uh, destroyed. Uh, their capital was completely destroyed. They became absolutely poor and so on. So it was a very brutal period. So Gorbachev's argument was that, this is the, as I understand it, that the Soviet Union's economy, politics had become so bureaucratic and, and that the, uh, the Soviet republics were, were wanted out that there was no, he had no choice but to step down and do what he did. Otherwise, there would have been civil war. Did he have a choice? The problem is not uh, he. The problem is the uh, situation in general. And he with his team. In some respects, Gorbachev was a puppet in the hands of the whole team of bureaucrats who really wanted uh, these changes, who really wanted to change their power and to receive capital and private property. And he was a puppet in these hands. <coughs> why he was not leader, why he was puppet? It's another question. It's a problem of his personal qualities. But uh, he, uh, or better to say, uh, this team of leaders uh, with Gorbachev, they did not prevent uh, destruction of the uh, socialism, or better to say uh, uh, in another way. It was necessary to transform, I want to, to repeat, it was necessary to transform a bureaucratic system and to change bureaucratic model of uh, so-called socialism and to create from below democratic model of socialism. Instead of that, it was destruction of the system of governing. Not destruction of bureaucratism, but destruction of governing. Bureaucratic governing is governing which is working for the in, in the interests of the bureaucrats, not in the interest of the people. But uh, if you want to change uh, the, well, I don't know, the course of the boat, it's not necessary to destroy the boat. Uh, something like that. Uh, some first intentions were very important and positive, uh, as I said, in, the, uh, in uh, 1985, 1986, 1997, and so on. But then uh, forces which uh, led to the destruction of the socialism of the Soviet Union came to power step by step. And here it's important to explain why, in general, Soviet Union collapsed or disappeared, better to say. Uh, uh, there are different explanations, but uh, my position is uh, following. Uh, for socialism, socialism is like a bicycle. It's necessary to move all time and move forward. And uh, for moving forward, socialism must have a basis, uh, engine. And the engine of socialism is not market. 
is not private uh, activity, competition, and so on. Engine of uh, communism, socialism, as first step, is uh, social creativity, if you want enthusiasm. In the beginning, uh, it's impossible to build a new society on the basis of only enthusiasm. But without enthusiasm, it's impossible to move in the direction of socialism and further to communism. It's necessary to have social creativity. And when we had this social creativity, it was very rapid development and positive development, even in bureaucratic uh, system, even inside uh, all these mutations, all these negative features, like in Khrushchev period in the uh, late 50s, uh, early 60s in 20th century. Uh, by the way, I will make small um, remark, important remark. Uh, in the West, there are a lot of positive words about Gorbachev, but I never heard positive words about Khrushchev. And in that period, we had the spring. We had much more freedom for culture, for science, for education. It was an almost jump in technologies, cosmos, nuclear uh, power stations, uh, new type of transportation, uh, automatic enterprises. We had first into automatic enterprise in 1960s with robot uh, production. It was the whole enterprise producing uh, this, uh, like, like, I don't know, some elements for uh, machines. Uh, it was enterprise producing these elements of machine without men at all in late 60s. So it was a lot of decisions in culture, uh, cinema, uh, fundamental science. And it was another atmosphere in the country. Of course, it was bureaucracy, a lot of negative features. It was a uh, one-party system. Uh, and it was growth of popularity of Soviet Union in the, in the world. Anti-colonial revolutions in all countries, in uh, Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, struggle against fascist dictatorship. Everywhere with support of Soviet Union. Millions of students in uh, Russian Soviet universities during this period. Wonderful country, wonderful development. Why West doesn't like it? Because it was a strong country, which when Gorbachev came to United Nations, he took a shoe and boom, boom, said you will have... You mean when Khrushchev, Khrushchev came? Khrushchev, Khrushchev, yes, yeah. yeah. By the way, uh, why uh, you said they like Gorbachev in the West, mainstream West, not left. And... Uh, I want to propose another, I have to say, fantastic story. Uh, what will be if today in our country and in former Soviet republics, in, I don't know, Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan, we have wonderful leaders with strong political forces who want to create a new Soviet Union with democracy, real grassroots democracy, with real self-management in the state enterprises, with free of church education, but with strong army, based on the enthusiasm of the people, with development of high-tech uh, sector and so on. Will West applaud to this leader? Look, he is for the freedom of speech. Look, he is for real democracy. Look, he is building just society. How good people, how good people in Russia, in Ukraine, in Belarus, in Kazakhstan, in uh, Tajikistan, they want to create again new peaceful, huge, big country with strong weapons, with strong technologies and uh, wonderful computer for all other countries in the world. Will they be happy? No. That's why they like Gorbachev not. not for democracy but for the destruction of the country, uh, destruction of the system, not the country even, destruction of the system, socialist system with all negative features, but socialist system which was real opposition to uh, world capitalism. And one more important aspect, which I want to stress, uh, it was not only Gorbachev who led to the destruction of the, let's say mutant socialism, bureaucratic socialism in the former world socialist system. Even earlier than in Soviet Union, in Czechoslovakia, in other West East European countries, we had changes. These countries had different leaders. Some were more strong, some were less, some were more smart, some less. But everywhere it was this change. Why? Let's come back uh, to the question why Soviet Union disappeared. 
because uh, Soviet Union in Brezhnev period, not in Gorbachev period, in Brezhnev period, late 60s, uh, 70s of the 20th century, Soviet Union lost engine. Bicycle stopped. And bicycle cannot st <laughs> stand, it must move. And uh, it was attempt to add the uh, market as engine for socialism, it doesn't work. It creates private business inside social. It's possible to have market, but as one of the tools to move, but not as dominant force. But to do what you say, to do what you're recommending, requires a real democratization of the politics. You can't have any enthusiasm in self-management if you're still dealing with a bureaucratic, uh, more or less police state. Uh, it's true, but not 100%. I will explain why. Uh, in the 1920s, even in early 1930s, uh, Soviet Union was not 100% uh, democratic state. It was one party system. It was no freedom of speech for anti-socialist forces. It was not mass repressions, but uh, if you started to make coup d'etat, you will be in prison or killed. Uh, and we had enormous enthusiasm because we had democracy on the grassroots level. Politically on the top, it was not pure democratic in bourgeois sense, but in the uh, low of, uh, level of enterprises, opportunity to create different social uh, initiatives, uh, NGOs and so on, it was possible. You're talking about the 1920s? 1920s and even 1930s, early 1930s. Uh, step by step, it was growth of bureaucratization of Stalin's dictatorship and so on. But even in the period of 1930s, when all these repressions started, when uh, 100,000 people, even up to 2 million people were repressed, uh, some of them were killed and so on, when Gulag appeared, only in that period we had enthusiasm from below because it was very contradictory mixture of creation of new state, new economy, new society, new education, new culture for people. From one hand, I don't know, left hand, and it was bureaucratic dictatorship from another. Finally, it led to the uh, uh, big enormous contradictions, but when the Second World War started, for us, it's great patriotic war, it was again a very strange model of enthusiasm, not strange. I can say beautiful, but uh, extremely tragic model of enthusiasm. When people were dying for the peace, we had uh, millions of people who went to the war voluntarily, went for dying. They were real heroes, young boys, old men, like 60 years old, 70 years old, when uh, Hitler was near Moscow. Uh, old people, 60, 70 years old, nobody made order, go and be killed. It was enthusiasm, if you want. It was a lot of uh, enthusiasm in the production sphere. Uh, Andrei Kalganov wrote a beautiful article about a lot of new projects, forms of uh, organization of management, technology, and so on. And it was a dictatorship because it was war. So it's very contradictory process. In, then after Stalin, it was Khrushchev Spring, and it was more or less dictatorship, less oppression of people, uh, less ideological pressure. It was, but it was less. And it was very rapid growth of flowers, of science, culture, and so on. In Brezhnev period, it was stopped because it was a real threat for bureaucracy. Uh, and uh, this uh, destruction of enthusiasm from below led to the transformation of the leaders. In the beginning, uh, leaders of Soviet Union were a mixture of bureaucrats with communists. Uh, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, all these people, they were bureaucrats. They were, in some aspects, uh, brutal dictators, but they came from World War II. And many of them were heroes of this war. Many of them, such, not Brezhnev, he was not killed. He was wounded, but not killed. But many such people like Brezhnev were killed in this war. 
Uh, that's why they had this double, I don't know, sense in the head, like schizophrenia. <laughs> I don't know how to say. They were at the same time bureaucrats and the communists. But then because of absence of enthusiasm from below, absence of control from below, this bureaucratic part of head was growing and became the whole head. <laughs> and communism disappeared. Mm. When I was in Central Committee, I don't remember if I said this or I just was thinking about it, but it was no one communist except maybe a few people. 300 leaders of communist party, 20 million communist party. They were not communists. They were not real enthusiasts of the creation of new society. They were bureaucrats with some illusions or without illusions, more or less cynical. For them, being a communist meant defending the party and the state. It didn't have a lot to do with the social content of that. Yes, and receive uh, different privileges. By the way, not very big, but still it was privileges. Uh, so uh, that's why it was uh, from both sides. It was growth of uh, conformism from below and growth of bureaucratism from the top. And uh, Gorbachev became a result of this uh, transformation. How much, and there's still an, a, another level of why, why does it become so bureaucratized? Is it, is it partly because that, you know, you can't have central planning and such control of the economy when you're using a pencil and paper? Like there was, there was no, you know, just the very beginnings of computer like how do you how could you possibly have such centralization with such primitive technology? So first of all, uh, it was not necessary to have absolute centralization. But they did, uh, and uh, uh, yes, and that was one of the reasons. But uh, a key problem was not even uh, centralization in economy. Key problem was a relatively low level of culture relatively low level of social creativity of masses uh, when the revolution took place. And, uh, you know, for socialism, the, the ideal, the best variant for socialist revolution is when you have strong left party with millions of people inside capitalism. You have huge trade unions, not bureaucratized trade unions. You have real initiatives from below in the sphere of green movement and other social movements. You had left intelligence inside capitalism. You don't have political party, political power, but you have all necessary uh, prerequisites. Opposition is strong, democratic, educated, cultural. You have theory, you have actors, you have experience, and then you have victory in the elections. Uh, and uh, wonderful, we are moving in the direction of socialism, step by step, from market to plan, from private property to social, from uh, formal bourgeois democracy to grassroots democracy, with contradictions, but we are moving. It's a wonderful picture. But really, when you have uh, high developed uh, capitalism, you have enormous control of uh, capital and bureaucracy over all spheres of life. It's another topic, but uh, with Andrei Kalganov, we wrote the, our book, Global Capital. By the way, it is published in uh, English with strange name, 21st century capital, like uh, <laughs> or capital 20, very similar with uh, this famous book. In Britain, it's published in um, Manchester University Press. It's not advertising, it's too expensive to buy. So <laughs> if anybody wants, I can say, send manuscript for free. <laughs> I don't uh, ask to buy for, I don't know, 100 pounds. So, uh, but what it's important, we wrote that it is totalitarian market. Market is totalitarian force, which control every step, every, uh, I don't know, every idea of personality. It's global hegemony of capital in all spheres from the uh, birth till the death. And in this situation, it's very difficult to build a position. And the position is growing mainly in this fear in the countries where there are very deep contradictions of capitalism, but where there is no this totalitarian power. Sometimes even there is a dictatorship, but there is no totalitarian power of market and capital. Uh, in Latin America, but they don't have enough, again, prerequisites there, like uh, Russia in, uh, before socialist revolution. 
and they cannot build new uh, socialism, uh, real socialism. They have these uh, limits. So we move far from Gorbachev, but it's an important question. Let's get back to Gorbachev and let me ask you another question people are talking about. Uh, even Putin has sort of suggested this in a way. Uh, why couldn't Gorbachev and the leadership done something more like what happened in China? Now, I'm not necessarily a big fan of the restoration of capitalism in China, but clearly something had to be done. Um, and, and they say, why couldn't Gorbachev had sort of managed this process the way Deng Xiaoping did it in China? So, uh, first of all, he could. Uh, not he personally, but it was possible from objective point of view, except for very important aspects. It was impossible to make, uh, let's say, more market, even with elements of capitalism, uh, uh, model of uh, for, few, for Soviet Union after, let's say, Gorbachev or during, Go I'm sorry, uh, let's start from the beginning. It was possible to move in the direction of development of market and even private property. But uh, Soviet Union in the uh, 80s, 1980s, was not a country with the domination of uh, uh, peasants, was not a country with domination of uneducated people. It was a country with uh, one half of people with high education, with very high level of culture and so on. So to continue bureaucratic dictatorship with market and capitalism, I think was impossible. But it was possible to move in the direction of uh, socialism with more real grassroots democracy and market and some elements of capitalism. But in the same time, with strong control of socialist, or better to say people's state over capital and market. Uh, when I was in China, I said, market is not, you know, it's a very famous word, uh, words of Deng Xiaoping, that it doesn't matter what is the color of the, uh, of the cat, it's important uh, that uh, cat catch mouse. White cat, black cat, as long as it catches the mouse. Yeah, or red or black cat, doesn't matter. It does matter. Because market is not uh, cat, it is tiger, as I said in China. And tiger is a very dangerous, you know, or lion, if you want. Yeah? So it's necessary to control. It's necessary to restrict. It's necessary to have strong power. Democratic, but strong. Gorbachev made uh, some forms of democracy, but uh, they didn't make democracy power. Democracy means demos kratos. Demos people, real people, not uh, intelligentsia who are saying something. And kratos is power. If we decided something, we must do this. If you don't support us, you will be punished. This is, this is clearly this is real just power. the beginning of a series of conversations we need to have. Um, so let me ask you one final question for today. And then you, I know you're going on a trip. When you come back, we'll schedule another session and we'll keep going. Um, so here's the, the final question for today. During the period of the lead up to the uh, dissolving of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev's re resignation, uh, t what is the role and, and, and how important is it, the role of the U.S. and the West in encouraging the more open market, shock therapy, loot the public ownership, how important was the West in the demise of the Soviet Union? Uh, it was not main role, but it was important and very negative role. You know, sometimes when there is nearly balance, even small uh, additional uh, money, small additional uh, uh, power and so on can change uh, the equilibrium. So it was a very uh, big struggle. And by the way, it was not only one way, uh, Gorbachev and then destruction of the Soviet Union. We had another possible, objectively possible scenarios of development. And one of them was a real democratic socialism with a lot of contradictions, but democratic socialism. And if, let's make a fantastic story. 
if we have not United States, uh, Germany, Western Germany, uh, NATO as uh, counterpartners of reforms in Soviet Union, but strong, really democratic socialist states in the United States, democratic socialism. In Western Germany, democratic socialism. In Britain, democratic socialism. I don't think that in Soviet Union we have in this situation uh, Yeltsin's power, brutal shock therapy, and so on. Uh, of course, it again, it was not because the United States uh, uh, intervened in Soviet Union. It was not because Gorbachev was spy or agent of CIA. It is also typical for some Russians to say that he was uh, agent of Central Intelligence Agency or I don't know, Mossad or MI6 or something like that. It's not true, of course. But it was very important additional pressure on our country in the direction of uh, not even social democracy, but in the direction of brutal primitive accumulation of capital in the form of liberal capitalism, but just form. And what is important, we did not discuss geopolitical or foreign policy as the aspect of Gorbachev relations. It was possible to have another model of transformations in this sphere, of course. And finally, uh, I want to stress that disintegration of Soviet Union and collapse, uh, well, not the end, but defeat, um, uh, not final defeat, but defeat of socialist project in uh, late 80s, in 1991, led to the enormous problems for all world. After that, instead of peace, why wars? In Russia, capitalism, in the United States, capitalism, everywhere capitalism, why wars? Why? Thousands, millions of people finally killed for these decades, during these decades. Why? Because capitalism means militarism, wars. It's law of capitalism. And inside uh, former Soviet Union territory, we had permanent wars. In Chechnya, in Moldavia, in Georgia, between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, enormous amount of victims. And modern situation uh, in Ukraine is also a result of this destruction. Because in Soviet Union, it was doesn't matter if Crimea or Donbass is part of Russian Federation or Ukrainian, not if it was Russian Socialist Feder Federative Soviet Republic or Ukrainian Republic. It was really one state. And uh, territories were moving from one former republic, formal republic, to another formal republic. Donbass was part of Russia until 1920s, then it became part of Ukraine. Crimea was part of Russia, then became part of Ukraine. And it was a lot of such transformations in Kazakhstan with Russia, in between different countries. It was no problem. But when uh, this separation started, it became basis for the wars. Uh, and uh, we didn't discuss this question. And uh, you know, maybe people know so in the West that in Russia we have a lot of restrictions for uh, discussion about situation in Ukraine and in Russia we have world special military operation. It's a, the only possible world in Russia for this event. Uh, and I said before this operation and said for Russian public in the beginning of operation, uh, it was February 25th or 6th, I don't remember exactly, when a video appeared, that I don't support this. Uh, in Russia we have majority 70, 80 percent, according to official opinion polls, who support this operation. Uh, other people abstain or did not support. So I belong to my minority, as I said. Uh, but uh, in order to analyze this uh, situation, it's necessary to have a real uh, opportunity to speak without restrictions, without uh, self restrictions and formal bureaucratic restrictions. It's and uh, also it is a big problem because information which we have uh, in Russia uh, with video reports, with figures, with uh, data, with uh, observers and so on is absolutely not uh, the same as information in the West. Uh, and honestly, I cannot say that Western information is 100% truth. At least I know that uh, in the West, information about wars in Vietnam, in Iraq, in Syria, 
in uh, Libya was not, uh, it was a lot of, uh, let's say, falsifications. I cannot say that in Russia it's 100% uh, facts, but uh, that's why it's very difficult to make real suggestions. And it's also necessary to remember about prehistory, uh, all these provocations, uh, enlargement of NATO, uh, in 2014 started a uh, real war against Donbass, so it is important prehistory, all this prehistory. Uh, but finally, I said my position, I expressed my position. Simply, I ask people to remember that destruction of Soviet Union is the, the most deep reason of all these things. Military nature of capitalism is the main fundamental reason of all these things. And now it's possible, I think, uh, in these forms of capitalism, which we have in 21st century, it is uh, very difficult to say how to make just peace if we have such forms of capitalism everywhere. And uh, I think today uh, it's even more important than ever before to say that only socialist trend is basis for the peace and um, negation of wars. It's abstract word, but let's remember it was World War One. Why it is really was why this war was really stopped because of the revolution in the Russian Empire in Germany and mass left movements everywhere. And now we are on the border of extremely deep and uh, terrible conflicts. And if we will not, we will not think, uh, if we are not thinking about a socialist alternative, I'm afraid that uh, on the basis of one or another model of capitalism, more imperialistic, less imperialistic, it's impossible to stop. And uh, maybe postscriptum. Uh, I am afraid that now we have even threat of regress of capitalism from from imperialism, regress from imperialism. Because it could be, you know, empires uh, existed in feudal epoch with terrible wars, but wars for the territories, wars for the power of kings and so on. So it was not uh, imperialist uh, type of wars. And now we have different types of wars, uh, forms of wars. They all brutal or all, all destructive. Why? Uh, Pakistan and India had enormous conflict with uh, thousands, thousands, thousands of victims. India was imperialist, no. Pakistan was imperialist, no. C capitalism. Uh, so let's remember about this. I think it is very important. All right. Thank you, Alexander. When you come back from the trip, we'll schedule uh, the yes. second part of what, what needs to be a long series. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Goodbye, Paul. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. Uh, if you appreciate this kind of content, uh, please click the donate button, make a, a donation of some kind, uh, subscribe. Uh, if you're uh, on YouTube, get, most importantly, get on the email list, come over to the website, uh, whether you're listening on podcast or all the other platforms. Uh, thanks very much for joining us on the analysis.news. Mm -hmm.